we start a new lecture. So today we will talk about AFSAR classes and interfaces. We'll have a lab that involves creating multiple AFSAR classes and interfaces. Uh, we'll also have a few problems from the previous chapter on the exceptions and we are going to combine all of them uh, and we'll have a recording for the lab at the end of the class. So we know a little bit about AFSAR classes and interfaces because it was actually material that we had in the previous class. But today we are going to go into the theoretical basis of abstract classes and interfaces. This concept is not new in Java. Uh, it was actually invented in previous implementations of uh, programming languages, like for instance in C++. So we will start with the same example that we started uh, to discuss in the previous class. That is the paint kind of application that uh, defines a class geometric object with several uh, properties, color, field, date created. And then we implement subclasses of geometric object, circle, rectangle, and so on. So the abstract class geometric object is only created in order to have uh, all the properties that are common to all of the types of uh, geometric objects that we have in this paint application or uh, Photoshop application or Illustrator application. And all of these properties that all of the uh, geometric objects have a color, have a data, uh, a data field uh, named field, if it's field or not, have a date that it would, uh, they were created and so on, are grouped together into a single class. In this way, the implementation of all the methods rele relevant for these uh, data fields are actually only implemented once, and we eliminate any redundancy in the subclasses. So you can consider that there are other subclasses of geometric object like triangle, which is part of the lab today, and many other subclasses. You can have a class for ellipse, for hexagon, and so on. So the class geometric object doesn't actually create an object because we have no actual sides of this object. We actually do not have the geometrical properties of these objects. We only have the color, the field, and date created. So this class is only used for containing the properties that are common to all geometric objects. Such a class is called virtual in C++ uh, and is called abstract in Java. It basically is a class that is not supposed to be created. Uh, we are not supposed to create uh, an object of this class directly. We are creating objects of the type circle, rectangle, and other subclasses of geometric object, we are not creating a geometric object itself. So an abstract class is just used for grouping together all the properties for the subclasses. And the fact that this class is defined as abstract tells us that we cannot create an instance of this abstract class. It's just used for grouping the properties. In this example, we can see that the class geometric object has the data fields, color, field, and date created. They will be uh, inherited by all of the subclasses. It has uh, constructors, and these constructors are not inherited. We said in the previous class that constructors will be used during constructor chaining to create an instance of the subclass. It basically calls the constructor for the subclass, like for instance the circle or the rectangle constructors, will call the superclass constructor geometric object as the first statement in those constructors. So it first creates the data fields for the superclass and then it adds the additional data fields for the subclass, like radius for circle and width and height for rectangle. All of the other methods are inherited, so if we create an object instance of circle, it will have methods for getting the color, checking that the field data field is true or false, and setting these data fields. 
In addition to these methods that are inherited, we also have so-called abstract methods. They are methods that are only defined as method signatures in the superclass, like geometric object, but they don't have an actual implementation at the level of geometric object. So the only goal for these methods is to actually set constraints for all the subclasses that are not abstract to implement these methods. So the abstract methods have a signature, like in this case, get area returns a double and get perimeter returns a double. But these values cannot be actually be computed at the level of geometric object because we have no sizes or no shapes, in fact. So they will be implemented by all of the subclasses, in our case, circle, rectangle, and other subclasses like triangle and so on. In fact, when we wrote the UML diagram for this class, we don't even specify the fact that uh, these are implemented in the subclasses because it's understood the fact that these must be implemented in all the subclasses. They are basically constraints. They must be implemented by the subclasses uh, and each one of the subclasses will have an implementation of those methods, get area and get perimeter. So when we write the class geometric object, we add the modifier abstract after the visibility modifier and after the class keyword specifying that this class is a geometric object class. And again, then the meaning of this is that this class is only used to group together all the properties of geometric objects, but we cannot create an instance object of this class because this class is abstract, is only used for grouping. In addition to the keyword abstract, we would want to also add two abstract methods, methods that do not have a signature, do not have an implementation, they have a signature, and in this case, get area returns a double, and get perimeter returns also a double. They do not have an implementation at the level of geometric object because those implementations will actually be implemented in the subclasses, the concrete non-abstract classes, circle and rectangle. So like in the previous class, we extend the class geometric object by the subclass circle and later by rectangle. And we implement the abstract methods. So at the level of circle, because we have a radius data field, we can implement a get area method that returns the radius square multiplied with math of pi. And the get perimeter method that returns 2 multiplied with the radius multiplied with pi. And these are the concrete implementations for the two abstract methods that were defined in the abstract superclass. Similarly to the class circle, we implement the class rectangle that also extends geometric object. If you look at the previous lecture on inheritance, you will see in detail all of the rest of the class, basically that it defines a width and a height. And in addition, we also define the, the two methods, get area and get perimeter, which override the, the definition of get area and get perimeter in the superclass geometric object. Again, those two methods were defined as abstract in the class geometric object, and now we are defining them concretely in the subclasses rectangle and uh, circle. We can write a test uh, uh, driver, basically a main method that creates two geometric objects, geometric object one and geometric object two of the classes circle and rectangle. And you can see here the use of polymorphism and inheritance. Again, these are covered in the previous lecture where we are assigned an object of the type circle and an object to a, of the type rectangle to two variables geo object one and two of the super type geometric object and the reason for that is that a circle is a geometric object and a rectangle is a geometric object the advantage of having these two variables as geometric objects is that we rely on dynamic binding to bind the concrete methods for all of the methods that are defined in geometric object, including the abstract methods. So we know that any geometric object has 
uh, get area and get perimeter methods. Then we call the method equal area. Equal area takes two geometric objects as parameters and compares the two areas. We know that they must have a get area method because every geometric object uh, implementation must have a get area method. It's a constraint on the subclasses to implement that specific method. That method was defined as abstract in geometric object, but any object instance that we could get uh, of geometric object must have an implementation of get area and get uh, perimeter. So we say that two geometric objects have the same a equal area if the area of object one, which is a double, is equal with the area of object two, which is also a double. So we can compare them with double equal operator because they are both of primitive type double. Similarly to the equal area, we implement a method display object. Display geometric object takes two geometric objects as parameters. And again, we print the area and the perimeter of those objects. So again, it doesn't matter what is the specific type, concrete type of object. They are both geometric object. So they must have a get area and get perimeter methods. So now let's talk about the actual uh, concrete facts about geometric object and abstract classes. So an abstract method cannot be contained in a non-abstract class. We must have that the class is also abstract such that it may contain abstract methods. In a non-abstract subclass extended from an abstract class, all of the abstract methods must be implemented. So exactly what I said, it's a, con it's a constraint, the fact that all the abstract methods that are inherited from an abstract class must implement all of the abstract methods. Even if they are not used in such subclass, they must be implemented. So if we create any subclass of geometric object, we must have a get area and get perimeter methods in that, those subclasses because they were defined as abstract in the superclass. But this is only in non-abstract subclasses, because if a subclass of an abstract superclass does not implement all of the abstract methods, then the subclass is also defined as abstract. And that basically means that its own subclass will now have to implement these abstract methods. So we are deferring the implementation of the abstract methods to the subclasses. So let's actually do an experiment to understand exactly what the meaning of this slide is. Very dense. It basically says everything that we need, but we have to actually experiment with each one of the, the steps in this example. So in the first step, we are saying that an abstract method cannot be contained in a non-abstract class. So we are going to start Eclipse. Let's create a class. So let's name this class the class A. The type already exists, so let's call it one class. So again, if we have any abstract method in one class, let's call it public abstract method that returns void m, it will tell us that it's an error to have, uh, we can't have an abstract method in a non-abstract class. So let's make one class abstract. So now the method m will be correct. So let's remove the, the body of this method and now it's an abstract method. Okay, so the first statement in this slide is clear. We cannot have an abstract method in a non-abstract class. Now, if we have a non-abstract subclass of the abstract class, all of the abstract methods must be implemented. So again, we can define another class. Let's call it another class, which extends one class, the one above. It will tell us that 
you cannot actually have this class that is a syntax error unless we add the unimplemented method and that unimplemented method is the method m so the method that was defined as abstract in the super class must be concretely defined in the subclass this is the second statement that we had in this slide basically in the non-abstract subclass extended from the abstract class all of the abstract methods must be implemented so abstract methods are constraints now if the subclass of the abstract superclass does not implement all of the abstract methods then that subclass must be defined as abstract so another way to fix the fact that this class extends the superclass and not implement that method is to define the class another class as abstract uh, let's put it before the keyword class so now there are no more errors basically tell us that it tells us that the constraint that we must implement the, the abstract method m is actually now deferred to the subclasses of another class so again if we define another class let's call it yet another that extends another class and this is a non-abstract class it will tell us that we must add the unimplemented method m so abstract methods must be implemented eventually uh, either in the subclasses or if the subclasses are abstract then in their own subclasses one keyword that you will see here this is a java notation it's override is not actually required is optional in fact we can delete it and nothing changes the advantage of having it and we basically can leave it in is that it tells the compiler that we know that we are overriding a method in the super class so in fact it tells us that we know what we are doing so it's it's not required to have this keyword override it's just used by the compiler if we try to define a different method that actually doesn't override the super class method it will tell us that there is a compilation error so if we change the signature of m it will actually tell us that this override does not override the super class uh, method so it tells us that one option is to remove the override annotation again you can actually not use it and then the program is still correct there is no error and no warning in fact in this case that we don't have the keyword override we are not going to cover java annotations in this class they are mostly used for java enterprise edition for creating server annotations okay so let's return to the lecture notes we actually wrote a short program to test all of this topics that we had here that abstract methods must be in abstract classes subclasses of abstract classes must either implement the abstract methods or they must be abstract themselves and then to defer the implementation of the abstract methods to their own subclasses if we create an object we must create it of a concrete class we cannot create an object from an abstract class using the new operator we must still define constructors in fact all classes in java contain constructors which will be invoked during constructor chaining and again constructor chaining is when we actually before we create an instance of the concrete subclass it calls the superclass constructor and that is done by default as the first statement of the constructor okay just to remember what that means let's again do an experiment so all of these classes that we defined above actually have constructors the default constructors let's actually define them explicitly so we define the first constructor one class and this one prints a message uh, 
and let's call this message one similarly we are going to define constructors for the two subclasses so this is another class and this is yet another And let's add a main method to the public class. In which we are creating an object of the type yet another. So we can see that by default, before we actually run the message 3 to print that uh, specific uh, message, it actually calls the superclass constructor. And the same happens in its superclass. If in another class, we have also a call to the superclass constructor. So it will actually print first message 1, then message 2 and message 3 although all that we did in the main method we actually created uh, a yet another object and let's run this from one class and it prints the three messages so again the idea is the following if we draw this the diagram of this case in violet we created one super class, an abstract class called class one class. And this was an abstract super class. We actually are going to use a message to state that this is an abstract class because we can't make it italic. Then we had a subclass of this called another class, which was also abstract. And then we had another subclass, which was concrete, yet another. So when we create an instance of yet another, it actually first calls the superclass constructor, which in turn calls its own superclass constructor. And first it creates a one class object, then it adds to that the data fields of another class and then it adds to it the data fields of yet another and this happens for any object of the type yet another and here is the implementation of what we just brought okay so in the case of the class geometric object which was abstract the constructor for geometric object will be called by the subclasses circle and rectangle so it will actually create a date, created data field, which contains the current date, which is added to all of those objects. A class containing abstract methods must be defined abstract. We said that before. An abstract class without an abstract method is possible. Basically, we don't need, like in this example, to have abstract methods. We, the classes can still be defined abstract, but we have no abstract methods in this class it's basically used for adding to for grouping together all the properties of the subclasses so the class is used as a base class for defining the subclasses we still have the same constraint that we cannot create instances of this class using the new operator because this class is abstract so the same constraints that we had before are also applied to the subclass a superclass can be abstract even if it's a subclass can be abstract even if, if its own superclass is concrete. And as an example, we can actually take the class uh, geometric object. Geometric object is abstract, but its own superclass is the class object. So you can have the case 
let's draw the diagram here, that you have a concrete non-abstract class, and that's the class object. And then you have subclasses, like in our case, these classes, which are abstract. In the case of one class, is a subclass of geometric object, but this is abstract, but the class object is concrete. And it, let's actually do an example. We cannot create an instance of one class, but one class extends object. And we can create instances of object. Okay. So we cannot create instances of one class because that's abstract. If we try to do something like that, like new one class, it will actually show that this is an error. You cannot instantiate a class that is defined to be abstract. But you can instantiate its own superclass, which is concrete, which is the class object. So this will run and it will actually create an object. Okay, so a, sub a subclass can be defined abstract if, even if its own superclass is concrete, which means non-abstract. And the example is object is concrete, but the superclass is uh, the subclass geometric object is abstract. A subclass can override a method from its superclass and to define it as abstract. It's rare but useful when the implementation of that method in the superclass becomes invalid and we want to force the subclasses to implement that method. So let's again see an example. For instance, we can define in one class the method toString to be abstract. So now we are actually forcing the subclass yet another to implement that method toString. So we can define a method that was defined in the superclass uh, concretely we can define it as abstract in an abstract class. And now classes that are subclasses, like in our case, yet another is a concrete non-abstract subclass of a class that is abstract, which was a subclass of the abstract class that invalidated the toString method, must implement the toString method. So here we have to actually return a string which it's relevant for yet another. So it will actually return a string for yet another. So again, we can overwrite a method that was concrete in the superclass to define it as abstract in the subclass. And that will actually invalidate that method from the superclass. So the, the subclasses now must define those uh, methods. You cannot create an instance of an abstract class using the new operator, but you can actually uh, define, you can use variables of the abstract class. So it is correct to create a geometric object variable C, which is a reference type variable. And now after assigning it the reference for a new circle with radius of two, will contain actually a reference, a pointer to the circle. It also it's allowed to create an array of uh, elements of the type of the abstract class. So geometric object was defined as abstract. We can actually create an array geo of new geometric objects. Each one of them has basically references to, uh, to actual geometric objects once we assign them. At, at the current time, all of these have a null reference because we actually didn't create instances of subclasses of geometric objects. Again, we have double reference. Geo is a reference to an array of 10 references. Initially, they are all null, but once we start assigning to Geo of 0, Geo of 1, and up to Geo of 9 actual objects, like a new circle, a new rectangle, and so on, we will have actual references to those new objects. 
so actually let's do an experiment before we continue with other topics basically how to uh, what kind of abstract classes are in the java uh, uh, api let's actually do such experiments so let's go to our geometric object class in geometric object the geometric object class was defined as abstract and later we are going to add interfaces that are implemented by geometric object as part of the lab today but for the moment we can actually create we have a method main and this method main already contains uh, an array i call i called it go an array of 20 geometric objects I initialize geometric object of 0 with a new rectangle, geometric object of 10 with a new circle, and then in a loop I create clones uh, which will cover later today of those uh, two objects. I will clone the rectangle 9 times and I will clone the circle 9 times. And then more methods that we will discuss today as part of interfaces. So this actually shows the fact that we, create, we can create an array of geometric objects as long as we basically initialize them with actual objects, concrete objects. Any questions before we continue with API questions from uh, the Java API? So if there are no questions, let's continue. So in the Java API, we have a lot of abstract classes. In fact, one that is used a lot is the, class, the abstract class calendar. And one of the subclasses, a concrete non-abstract class uh, of calendar is called Gregorian calendar. Is the current, uh, basically, calendar system used uh, by us in, in uh, uh, US. So an instance of Java util date represents a specific time with millisecond precision since January 1st, 1970 GMT is called the Unix epoch time and the Java util date represents a single uh, with a single long value uh, time re with respect with that date because it basically stores how many milliseconds have passed from that moment in time. But all of the methods for getting the current month, year, and so on are declared to be deprecated. The reason why is that you can get such values for your current time zone, but you should really get them with respect to a calendar system. And the calendar system that we are currently using is the Gorian calendar. So Java Util Calendar is an abstract class for extracting this detailed information such that such as the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second from a date object for a specific calendar object, for a specific calendar. All the subclasses of calendar implement specific calendar systems, such as the Gregorian calendar, the modern calendar that we are using. But there can be other calendar systems, like the lunar calendar, the Jewish calendar, and so on. So the Java Util Gregorian calendar is a concrete implementation for the Gregorian calendar. So the Java API for java.util.gregorian uh, uh, calendar is actually available online. And it actually states that we can create a Gregorian calendar to create a Gregorian calendar object for the current time. And we can also create Gregorian calendars for specific year, month, and date to create a Gregorian calendar object for those specific uh, uh, dates. One thing that you have to be aware of is that in the fashion of uh, programming languages, where we have zero for the first element of an element of an array or the first character of a string. The same uh, is used for months, 
for instance, 0 is used for January, and of course this goes to 11 for December, which may not be uh, actually ideal because it's not really up to the intuition. We use 1 in our normal calendars for January and 12 for December, but this is the Java API. So the abstract class calendar contains constructor to actually create a, a, a calendar object, and then they contain it contains methods for getting, basically, for every possible field, like for instance, month, year, and so on, a, uh, uh, the, the value of that specific field. So the get method takes as parameter the field that we are interested in, and that field is usually a constant, an integer, defined in the java.util calendar, which is, for instance, calendar.month, calendar.year, calendar.date, and so on. We will see actually the list of possible fields, and it returns the value for that specific field. Similar, we have an access a mutator method set that given the value of the, the field and the value of that field, it sets the value of the current calendar with that specific value. Then we have the subclass Gregorian calendar, which is a concrete class. You see that I'm not using italic anymore for the subclass the Gregorian calendar, which is used for uh, abstract classes. If we have an editor that actually allows us to use italic for the uh, abstract class uh, mat, uh, name. And the uh, concrete class Gregorian calendar allows us to create a Gregorian calendar for the current time, a Gregorian calendar for a given year, month, and day, with zero for the value for uh, uh, the first month, and a Gregorian calendar for the current year, month, day, e hour, minute, and second. So again, the fields can have values from the following constants defined in the calendar class. Year stands for the field for the year of the day of the calendar. Month stands for the month of the calendar, starting with zero for January. Date stands for the day of the year. Hour stands for the hour of the calendar in the 12-hour notation. Hour of the day stands for the same hour of the calendar, but in a 24-hour notation, so they use 23 for 11 p.m. Minute stands for the minute of the calendar. Second stands for the second, or in the current minute. Day of the week is the day of the week starting with 1 for Sunday, 2 for Monday, up to 7 for Saturday. Day of the month is the same with date. It basically returns the date of the current calendar with one for the first day, two for the second day, and so on. Day of the year is a number of the year with basically how many days have passed from the beginning of the year of that calendar. Again, it, stands, it starts with one for the first day of the year. Week of the month is the number of the week within the month. Week of the year is the same for Basically, the number of the current week of the e of the uh, ca the calendar month, uh, we uh, uh, ca calendar week within the ca year, a.m. and p.m. return zero for a.m. and one for p.m. And let's see an example. For instance, if I want to create a calendar object, I would create a calendar variable of the type calendar, and we know that that's an abstract class but we initialize it with a new Gregorian calendar. This will create a calendar for the current uh, date and time. And then we can actually print the milliseconds, which is the new date that will print the, the use the method to string for date. But then if we want the year, we, we can get that integer with the method get, and we pass in the field. In this case, is the constant year within the calendar class. Similarly, we can get from the current calendar object the month, the date, the hour, the hour of the day in a 24-hour notation, the minute, the second, the day of the week, the day of the month, the day of the year, the week of the month, the week of the year. We can get if it's a.m. or p.m., 
currently is PM, so it will return one. We can get, uh, we can create a calendar object for any date that you want. Like for instance, if you want to see on what day of the week will January first, two thousand twenty, occur, and you can create a Gregorian calendar for two thousand twenty, January zero, and day one, and it will actually. Uh, print with the get method uh, we can actually get the day of the the week so the day of the week get method we return an integer if that integer is one we we actually return sunday if it's two we return monday and so on up to saturday otherwise we return null this is a value that we basically return if uh, we'll never reach this statement because this method will only return a value between one and seven but we must have a return statement on all the possible execution paths. So we are required in the method day, uh, uh, day name of week to actually have a default case. We cannot avoid having a default case in this case to return some value if the day of the week was neither from 1 to 7. Okay, one of the values from 1 to 7. Any questions? So, in order to use Gregorian calendar and calendar, you must actually import these classes. So, if we want to do an experiment, let's actually create one. Let's call it test Gregorian calendar. And we are going to create first a variable of the type calendar and again in order to use that class we have to import it from the java util uh, package again we are going to create an object of the type gregorian calendar so we can't use the because calendar is an abstract class we cannot use the new operator on calendar but we can use it on Gregorian calendar and this will actually create an object of the type Gregorian calendar which now we can actually print the, the values of this object so again we can use the get method to print all, all kinds of values for this calendar so we can get the calendar dot day, which actually day of the, let's say, day of the year. How many days have passed since the beginning of the year 2018? And it tells us that this is the day 177 of the year. And similarly, we can print other details of the current day, like for instance, we can print the hour again if we print it it prints now it's the hour zero it's again starts with zero for 12 o'clock and ends with uh, 11 for 11 p.m if we want to see the hour in a different system uh, basically in uh, the 24 hour system then we can use hour of the day and then it will print 12 for 12 o'clock okay and again we can print all of kind all kind of details by changing the constant of the calendar so you can choose am pm day of the month date and so on any questions Okay, good. So let's continue with interfaces. What exactly is an interface? One thing that you may have noticed up to now in Java is that Java is a single uh, inheritance hierarchy for classes. What that means? It means that you cannot one subclass, like for instance our class, another class, can only extend one superclass. We cannot actually say that this class also extends some other class 
let's say, object. That is not allowed in Java. You cannot extend one. Uh, you cannot extend more than one superclass. So, in that case, how can we actually create interface? Uh, can, can we create classes that implements multiple behaviors? Like, for instance, we implement that our current class is comparable with other classes, is clonable, and so on. So. An interface would allow us to do that. In fact, we can have a single super class, like we had in our hierarchy here, but our subclasses, like for instance one class, may implement multiple interfaces. So an interface is a class-like construct. It starts with interface, but it allows us to actually define multiple interfaces. We can have an interface clonable, we can have an interface, let's say, comparable, and so on. Each one of these interfaces may actually contain abstract methods. So we can actually have abstract methods like anything that is comparable has to be compared with some other object. So compare to takes another object O and returns an integer. Let's say positive if the current object is greater than that object or negative otherwise. So in this case, basically we say that our subclass, not only it's a subclass of object, but it also implements other interfaces. It implements clonable, it implements comparable, and so on. So we have a single inheritance hierarchy for class hierarchy. We cannot implement two super classes, but we can implement as many interfaces as we, as we would like. And what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that we can have other hierarchies. We have one hierarchy for the class uh, for the class hierarchy, but we may actually specify that only some classes, like for instance, the on class implements the interface clonable, and maybe some subclasses, other subclasses implement clonable. So we may have a single hierarchy of classes. Like for instance, let's say that we have this hierarchy in which Class A is a superclass. Class B is another superclass. It's, an, it's another class that implements A, uh, extends A. Class C also implement, uh, extends, but only some of them are comparable. So, for instance, only one class and C are comparable. The class A and B are not comparable. Okay, So an interface is a class-like construct that only has const constants and abstract methods. Basically, it contains this kind of uh, constraints that methods must be implemented. Some methods are must be implemented. So why is it useful? Because it's like an abstract class. It actually specifies the intent that some behavior must be implemented by the objects that implement these uh, uh, interfaces. For instance, we can specify that only certain objects, certain subclasses, are comparable or addable or clonable and so on. So interfaces allow multiple inheritance in Java. Without interfaces, you would only have single inheritance. So how do we define an interface? Just like we define a class, we use public, the modifier, then we use the keyword interface instead of class, and then the interface name. However, we have the restriction that we can only have constants, so public final, final uh, uh, declarations for data fields, and method signatures. Basically, we have all the methods are abstract. We cannot have implementations of methods in interfaces. 
And for instance, let's assume that we want to actually define uh, in a restaurant what are edible objects and what are not edible objects. So we can actually define the interface edible and we can specify that any class that implements the interface edible also uh, must implement a method how to eat, which returns a string representation of how do you eat an edible object. So an interface is a special class. In fact, it's treated like a class in Java. Each interface is compiled into a bytecode uh, dot class file, like a regular class. Like an abstract class, you cannot create an instance of an interface using the new operator and you can use the data type, you can use the interface as a data type for a variable as the result of casting because a concrete object is created for a concrete class, but you can actually cast any object to the interface. And as long as that object implements the methods for that specific uh, interface, you basically don't have a compiler error and a runtime error. So for instance, in our case, we specified the interface edible and that interface must uh, contains a method how to eat as an abstract method. If we say that a class, let's say chicken, implements edible, then the class chicken which extends animal also implements the interface edible. So it must implement the abstract method how to eat. And in the case of chicken, we basically return a string that uh, a chicken can be eaten by frying it. So now we can actually have a different hierarchy. We have one hierarchy for, let's say, implementing animals. We have the superclass animal, chicken, which extends animal and implements edible. But some kind of animals like tiger extend animal, but does not implement the edible interface. The reason is that uh, we can't eat a tiger. Uh, a tiger eats us, but we can't eat a tiger. So, similarly, we can have a class fruit, which is a super class. It, it extends the class object, but it also implements edible. Every type of fruit is also edible. And although at the level of the class fruit, this class is defined as abstract, so it doesn't have an implementation of the how to eat method. That method must be implemented by the subclasses, the concrete subclasses of fruit. So for instance, the class apple extends fruit. Uh, it implements the method how to eat concretely. The class orange extends fruit. It implements the method how to eat concretely. So if we create an array of objects in the main method in a public class test edible for our uh, case of edible interface, we see that we have a, an array of objects, new tiger, new chicken, new apple, and so on. For every object that we have in that specific list, we check if it's an instance of edible, and we, only in that case we cast the object to the interface edible, and we call the method out to it. So again, we don't actually care which subclass of edible is actually the in this case we are actually only interested in calling the method how to eat so we can cast the object to the type how edible and then use dynamic binding to actually find which actual implementation of of uh, how to eat is called is called for chicken and for apple so let's do this specific test so again, we are going to start in Eclipse. Let's create a new class. The class that I'm going to use in this case is the test class. Let's call it test edible. And it contains a main method, but we are not going to implement the main method until we have the rest of this class. So first we need the interface. So this is the interface edible. And the interface edible contains an abstract method. The modifier public abstract is not required. All the methods in interfaces must be public abstract. So we can write public abstract and then string how to eat.
but we are not required so we can actually omit public abstract and it's also fine because all of the methods in interfaces must be public okay so now we can define subclasses so we can define the class animal uh, there are many types of animals so basically we leave it as a super class in fact we can even define it as abstract if we like uh, we don't really have to so then we can define in instance uh, uh, subclasses of animals so we can define the class chicken which extends animal and implements edible And now we are required to implement the method how to eat. So we are required to write public string how to eat, which returns a string. In this case, we can just return fried. Similarly, we can define other classes like the class tiger is a subclass of animal but does not implement the how to uh, edible interface similarly we can define another class that uh, in parallel with the class animal let's ca call it fruit and again we can actually define it as abstract because at the level of this class and again we say that it implements edible but we are not required to actually implement that method how to eat in the class fruit. Why? Because it's an abstract class. So basically now we have the requirement on the subclass to implement the method how to eat. We could implement the method how to eat in fruit, but it's not specific enough. So we can define the class orange that extends fruit. And here we have to implement the method how to eat. You see that we have an error and it will tell us add unimplemented methods. I prefer to do it manually. So it also returns a string how to eat. And in the case of orange, we say return orange juice. And similarly, let's actually create another subclass of fruit, and that is the class apple. And we make apple cider. So in our public method main, we can actually create an array of uh, objects. Let's call it a for array and we can specify that this is a new object array and specify the elements of this array so we said that we can create an element that is a tiger so a new tiger maybe also a new chicken a new apple and that's it. We can create oranges and so on if you want to. For every object in, let's say, O, in this array A, we can actually check if that object is an instance of edible. And if it's an instance of edible, we can print the result of how to eat for that specific edible object and again in order to be able to actually call the method how to eat we need to actually cast the object to the edible interface although we already know that we actually uh, uh, check the fact that is an edible object 
So edible object O, call the method how to eat. So this will print basically that for the chicken we fry it, for the apple we make cider out of it. Okay, I use the for each loop as opposed to the lecture notes which use a for loop. So if we want we can actually do that. So this is this would be equivalent with this for loop for each loop and we can check the object directly as an instance instead of using an index for that array. Okay. Any questions about this example? You can also draw the UML diagram in this case. So the UML diagram will look as follows. Let's actually create a new diagram. So we have the class object, which is the superclass of all classes in Java. So we can start with that one. And we have a lot of subclasses. We have the class animal. We have the class tiger. We have the class chicken. We have another subclass of object, fruit, which is an abstract class. We define it as abstract. And we have subclasses of that. Let's create orange. And apple. So the hierarchy would look like this. Basically, animal and fruit are subclasses of object, tiger, chicken, and orange and apple are subclasses of those subclasses. Now, in addition to that, we have this interface edible. Let's put it here. And this is only implemented by some. So in this case, it also contains the abstract method how to eat. which returns a string. And this is only implemented by some of the subclasses. So fruits are edible and some of the animals, like for instance, chicken is edible, but not a tiger or other things. Like for instance, we may have other subclasses of object, like let's say geometric object and its own subclasses. Those do not implement the interface edible. So we have a tree hierarchy for basically classes and we have separate hierarchies for the interfaces. Those things that are edible, for instance, those things that are comparable, like for instance, some of this class, some of uh, the objects here implement the interface, let's say comparable. which requires the implementation of a method, again, abstract method, compared to, which takes an object O and returns an integer. But only some of the subclasses implement that specific interface. So let's say that we can compare geometric objects. Any questions? No. Okay. 
so what about omitting modifiers? I said at the beginning that uh, during the implementation that all the data fields are constants and all the methods are public abstract. But we can omit them. So for instance, instead of writing that the interface T1 contains the constant K, we can just write the constant K. Because all the data fields of interfaces must be public static final. Similarly, methods must be public abstract. So it's equivalent to actually leave those modifiers, omit them, leave them out, because we don't actually need to store them. The constant in an interface can be defined and then can be used as an interface name dot constant name. Like for instance, in our interface T1, we can use T1.k to access the data field k. It's only a constant, we cannot modify its value. It will be like uh, math.py, the value of pi, or math.e, the value of e in uh, mathematics. They are constant values computed and stored already in the system. So I said that there are two standard interfaces that most of the classes in Java implement, and those two are comparable and clonable. So the first one is comparable. The comparable interface is defined in the Java lang package. It defines that, the met that it contains a method compare to, and every object that implements the comparable interface must implement the compare to method that takes an object and it does an integer. And if you remember some of the classes that we discussed, basically the class string and the class date, actually implement the comparable interface in order to define a natural order of objects. If we compare two strings, it will do lexicographical order. If we compare two date objects, it will compare which date appears before the other date, so which is uh, earlier than the other date. And in each case, basically, if you create an instance of a string, it will check that it it's returns true that is also an instance of comparable. If you create an instance of Java Util date, it also returns that it it's if it it's it, if it's an instance of a comparable, it returns true. It's a comparable object. And how can that be uh, used for? We can actually use that for sorting strings for. Uh, comparing finding elements in binary search because basically it will use the interface uh, comparable to compare every two elements and check if one is less than the other, return a positive value if the first object is greater than the second, negative if it's less, and zero if it's equal. So the class string, the class date, they all extend the class object but they implement the comparable interface. And in the UML diagram, we specify interfaces similar to classes, but we precede them with the fact that is an interface, and we implement the method compare to, uh, which is required by that specific interface. Instead of using the, the full lines, for uh, inheritance, like we do in when we extend the class, we are using the dotted lines to specify that this is implements instead of extends, that it in, we are implementing an interface instead of extending another class. So how can we use these comparable objects? We basically can use the compare to method to check which object is greater than another. So Let's define a class max that contains a public static method max that takes two comparable objects and uses the compare to method to compare the two objects. So if we pass in strings or we pass in dates, this max method will take as inputs two comparable objects because both string and date implement the comparable interface. And it basically uses the method compare to. If O1 compared to O2 is greater than zero, then it returns O1 because O1 is bigger than O2. Otherwise, it returns O2. So the method max returns a comparable object, which is either O1 or O2. However, we can see that the return type of 
the method max is comparable. So if we want to assign the result of which one was bigger to a variable of the type string or to a variable of the type java.util.date, we need to actually cast the result of max to the type date or the type string. So the return value of the max method is either a comparable object or in the second case, another max method is an object, in which case we need to cast it to the type date or the concrete type string before we are actually assigning it to variables of those types. An alternative implementation of the max method is a method that takes two objects, object 1 and 2, and before it calls the method compare2, it casts the object O1 to, a comparable, to the comparable interface. So again, this will only work if the object O1 actually implements the comparable interface. Most classes in Java do implement it, and we actually should implement it always, even in our, in our own classes. So defining classes to implement comparable would be that our current class implements the comparable interface, and then we actually uh, implement the compare to method, the method that is defined as abstract in the interface. So we cannot use the max method on classes that do not implement the comparable interface, because the comparable interface only takes comparable objects or objects that are comparable. We can define a new class, like for instance, comparable rectangle that implements the comparable interface. Or, as part of the lab, you have to implement the comparable interface in the class uh, geometric object. And we are going to do that after the class today. So what does it mean that we implement a comparable rectangle? We actually implement the comparable rectangle implements the comparable interface by implementing the method compare to. So we define the class comparable rectangle, which implements the comparable interface. And in the compare to method, which takes an object as the input, we compare the area of the current rectangle with the area of the object O. After we cast the object O to a comparable rectangle, or even to a geometric object, because the geometric object has uh, the abstract method get area. In the case that the current object's area is greater than the comparable rectangle area, we return a positive value. In our case, I just return the value 1. If the area is less than the area of the comparable rectangle, then I return a negative 1. Otherwise, I return 0. It means that the two areas are equal. And in my example, I create two rectangles, one rectangle that has uh, width 4 and height 5, and another rectangle that has width 3 and height 6, and I actually invoke the method max. So the method max that we defined in the class max two slides ago basically takes two comparable objects and returns the one that is maximum with respect to the compare to method. So the method max will be invoking the compare to method, and through dynamic binding from the comparable interface we actually take the correct compare to method for comparable rectangle. And in our case, it will return that the first rectangle has an area that is bigger than the second one. 20 in the first rectangle, 18 in the second one. So it will return rectangle 1 as the object that is returned by the max method, and it will print that uh, rectangle 1 data, like for instance, width and height. The clonable interface is another java.lang uh, interface, basically is an interface in the Java API, also called a marker interface. A marker interface is an interface that does not have abstract methods. That means that it doesn't define constants or methods. It is used to denote a class that possesses a certain desirable property. A class that implements the clonable interface is basically marked to be clonable. That means that its objects can be cloned using the clone method defined in the object class or overridden in the current class. So the definition of the clonable interface is empty. It's just public interface clonable with no methods. It's a marker interface. But if we want to actually clone objects, we should actually 
implement our own override the method clone from the object class and implement our own cloning. And as an example, let me show you an example. The calendar class in the Java API implements the clonable interface. If we create a Gregorian calendar for, let's say, uh, February 1st, 2020, we can actually clone it as many times as we want by calling the method clone for that calendar and casting the result because the result is an object to the type calendar when we assign it to a calendar type variable. In this case, if we use the double equal operator, it will say that calendar and calendar copy are not the same reference. And that is completely true. Calendar is a reference to the original object of the type Gregorian calendar. Calendar copy is a reference to the clone of that calendar. Although they have the same date, they actually internally, they are two different objects. So equal equal compares the references, but if we actually check it with dot equals, we will see that the two objects are the actually equal. They actually contain the same uh, calendar uh, data fields. They contain the same year, month, date, second, millisecond, and so on, hour and minute. So implementing the clonable interface, we basically have to clone the clonable interface. If you actually try to clone an object instance of a class that does not implement the clonable interface, it throws a, no, a clone not supported exception. So the clone, but the clone method must be uh, enclosed within a try-catch block. We can override the method clone to create our own custom clones, and the clone method creates a new instance of the class and initializes its fields. So basically, we need to return an object, and that object will actually later be casted to the type of the variable to which we are assigning that object. So here is an example of a class that implements both clonable and comparable. So the class house, let's say that we, we want to develop a, a new neighborhood. And for that, we are going to first create the, the multiple houses that already exist in the neighborhood. So for instance, we, each house has an ID, has an area, and when it was built as a java.util.date object, but we also want to be able to just copy houses. Basically, if we want to, in this user interface, to add a new class, a new object instance of a house, a new uh, a house object, we actually need, we, we can do it by cloning the previously defined houses. So we can actually create another house using the clone method, and that will call the superclass clone method, in our case, the clone method in the object class. But instead of throwing the clone not supported exception, we can actually catch that and basically return null if it's not clonable. The compare to method takes another object which is uh, assumed to be a house and if the area of the current house is greater than the house's O area, then we return a positive value if it's less, we return a negative value. If it's equal, then we return zero, noting that these two houses have the same area. But what we just created is called actually a shallow copy. So what exactly is a shallow copy? Is a copy where the data fields of reference type, like for instance, when built, are actually just copied binary in binary mode. So we actually copied the same reference in the second object, house 2, which is a clone of house 1. That means that they both are references to the same date object. And this is a shallow copy because, in fact, when we clone a house, we may actually want to give access to change the date. And we don't want this date to be actually shared by the two houses. So a, sh a shallow copy is a copy where we basically co copy binary all the references and all the data fields. If we want to do a deep copy, a deep copy would actually create a clone, but then for every reference type data field, it will actually clone those data fields. 
so it will actually clone not it will create separate copies of the date and redirect the reference data fields to these new dates so in this example the clone method this is a deep copy example actually creates a clone of the original house but then redirects the house h when built to a clone of the date and you should do that for all of the data fields that uh, are reference types that means that there are objects or arrays you shouldn't do it for primary uh, primitive type data fields because those are actually copies the the data fields are actually aliases to the actual object in memory so if we compare interfaces with abstract classes we see that there are features which are common like for instance in interfaces and abstract classes we have abstract methods but there are also differences for instance in interfaces we cannot have concrete methods non-abstract methods but we can have that in abstract classes so from the point of view of variables abstract classes have no restrictions they can have data fields which are inherited they can have constants in interfaces all the variables must be constants must be public static final with respect with the constructors interfaces do not have constructors however abstract classes have constructors and those always will be called during constructor chaining with respect with a new operator we cannot use the new operator on the constructor of abstract classes and we cannot use the new operator on the on the interfaces because interfaces do not have constructors abstract classes can have any type of methods that means abstract and non-abstract methods interfaces must have only public abstract methods so you cannot define non-abstract methods with concrete implementations in interfaces you can implement as many number of interfaces uh, as you want so Basically, as opposed to inheritance in classes, you can extend a single superclass, but you can implement, uh, let's say, interface 1, which extends interface 1.1 one, one and extends interface 1.2. You can implement interface 2.1, one, one, you can implement interface 2.2, two, two, and you inherit all of the interfaces implemented by the superclasses. So, for instance, an object of the type class 2 is an instance of interface 1 2 of interface 1 1 of interface 1 of interface 2 2 of interface 2 1 of object of class 1 and on cla of class 2 so basically you inherit all the interfaces and all the classes that are super classes of the current class the only conflicts that can occur are constants that are defined to have different values in the interfaces that are implemented by uh, the current class or methods that return abstract methods that return different return types so if you have like for instance two interfaces and let's actually do an example so again let's create a class diagram and we have two interfaces let's call interface i1 which has a constant let's say integer k and k has the value 1 and then we have a different interface interface i2 and i2 defines the same k but equal with 2 of the type integer you cannot have one class that implements both interfaces that is not allowed in java because then if you are you are for this class let's call it class a if you ask what's the value of a dot k it it has two values and you cannot return two values as a single integer so that is one you cannot have two constants with different names so you cannot actually implement two interfaces with conflicting uh, constants the same you cannot implement two interfaces 
with the same signature but different return types. So what I mean by that is that let's assume that the interface I1 implements a method m which returns an integer and the interface I2 implements a method m which returns a double or even a different completely incompatible type like a string. A class like for instance A cannot implement at the same time both interfaces. We cannot have that a implements i1 and i2 because if we call the method m, if we implement the method m, it must return at the same time an int and a string. We can have, it's okay to actually have different signatures like for instance if m here takes as an input an integer then it's okay because this is overloading the method name m with two signatures, one that doesn't take parameters and one that takes integers as parameters. So then this is okay. But if we don't have that, if we have the same signature, that means the same method which takes no parameters, then it is a conflict to actually say that we are implementing both interfaces because it's not possible to return both a string and an int at the same time. So we, mu we must choose which interface to actually implement. So we cannot implement two interfaces with two methods with the same signature but different return type. So the question is when to use interfaces and when to use abstract classes or even super classes that are non-abstract. In most general cases there are two types of relationships of inheritance. One is called strong ESA and the other one is weak ESA. A relationship that describes a clearly a parent-child relationship should be modeled with class inheritance and therefore no interfaces. Like for instance that a, person, a staff member is a person or that a student is a person. That must be implemented with extents, with subclass inheritance. If we have weak is a, that means that an object possesses a certain property like is clonable or comparable that should be modeled using interfaces. For example, the fact that all strings are comparable, that therefore the string class implements the comparable interface. However, it extends the class object because every string is a concrete object. You can also use interfaces to basically circumvent the fact that in Java you have single inheritance restriction and therefore you can only have one super class but you can have as many interfaces as you want, as basically implemented by the current class. Before we continue with an example of interfaces, which is actually the use of the comparable interface of in Java using basically the wrapper classes for every primitive type, let's see if there are any questions about interfaces. So any questions about interfaces? or abstract classes. Let's continue. So now we start a new uh, an example of uh, interfaces and abstract classes. So we remember that Java has eight primitive types where if we define a variable of a primitive type the variable is actually an alias for the location of memory. And the reason why we have primitive types in Java is because it gives us better performance. Basically, the variable itself is a location that stores the value, like for instance, 1 or the character A and so on. And if we only deal with primitive types, like we compute, uh, let's say, the values of some uh, set of salaries from Excel, we can do it with primitive type double. We basically can read 
millions, uh, billions of values for salaries and compute average. Everything is done without creating a single object. But if we want to actually have properties for these values, like uh, two string method, if we want to check that they are equal with dot equals method, they will be objects and classes in Java. Now, the eight primitive types must be mirrored in the object hierarchy using what is called a wrapper classes. The reason for that is that data structures are defined with objects, like for instance, stack of objects that we created in the previous class or array list that we used in the previous class uses objects as the type of the elements in the array list. So if we want to, to copy a list of, uh, or we want to store a list of uh, 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 booleans or a list of characters or a list of integers in an array list, we actually have to convert that primitive type into an object. And Java already does that for us. Every primitive type since Java 1.5 has what is called a wrapper class. Boolean has the class Boolean. Car has the uh, class character, short byte integer long have the classes short byte integer long capitalized instead of using uh, lowercase letters only, and float and double have the classes float and double. So the wrapper classes basically wrap an object of the primitive type. Uh, for instance, the integer wraps an int. And that's basically uh, uh, the object that contains that int uh, whole number. Now, all of these classes, double, float, longer, long, integer, short, byte, character, and boolean, implement the comparable interface. The classes that are numbers also extend the class number, an abstract class, which is a subclass of the Java Lang object class. So it basically allows us to uh, implement and compare characters with other characters, float numbers with other float numbers, and so on. Each wrapper class overrides the method to string to actually return the value of that specific object, and the hash code method, which returns basically the number that you see in the to string printed as the unique value of that string object. Since these classes also implement the comparable interface, the compare to method is available for comparing any such objects. Like for instance, you compare two integer objects, two double objects, and so on. The number class is an uh, abstract class. Basically, it's the super class of all the number types. Each number wrapper extends the number abstract number class. The abstract number class contains methods for getting the double value, the int value, the float value, the long value, and also converting all of these to, to primitive data types, basically extracting the int value or the double value from the object itself. The method double value, float value, int value, long value are abstract. The methods byte value and short value are concrete. They basically are implemented in the number class concretely and they return the byte value of the int value and the short value of the int value. Each number wrapper class also implements the abstract methods value, uh, double value, float value, int value, and long value. So let's see an example. For instance, the class integer extends the class number, so it will implement the abstract methods int, long, float, double values. It also implements the comparable interface, so it will have a compare to method that compares two integer objects. Similarly, the class double extends the class number and implements the comparable interface. Both of the classes also define constants for the maximum value that can be stored in an integer object or in a double object, and similarly the minimum value that can be stored in an integer object or a double object. In addition to that, there are also the static methods value of, 
that return for a given string an integer object corresponding to that value of the string and a double object corresponding to the value of the string. So you can construct verbal uh, objects either from the primitive type value or from strings representing the primitive type values. And here are the two constructors for integer, one that takes an int and one that takes a string. And the two constructors for double, one that takes a double primitive type and one that takes a string. Each one of the numeric wrapper classes also contains the minimum and the maximum values that can be represented on that specific data type. So some of you use them for all kind of uh, max and mean methods. They are useful, uh, but sometimes you would just assign the first element of the data structure and that would be your initial minimum or the initial maximum. For float and double, the minimum value represents the minimum positive float number and double values that can be represented using basically a float and double. So the minimum is actually positive. In the case of float, is 1.4 e to the power minus 45. Basically, we can represent values up to the minimum value uh, 10 to the power minus 45, which is 1 divided with 10 to the power 45, which is basically 0 followed by 45 zeros, uh, then 1, 4. The maximum double floating point number is this number here, which we see that is very high, is basically 10 to the power 308. That's a very high number that can be stored in uh, numeric uh, values. The static value of method is a method that takes a string of representation of the number and transforms it into the wrapper type. So for instance, it takes 12.4 and we get a double object that represents that specific number. So it's a static method. We call basically this method with a string and returns an object, a reference type object, like uh, a number wrapper type in this case. There are also the static methods parse double and parse int, which we saw earlier this semester, where we basically pass the double or the integer and it parses them into the primitive types double and int. And this is what we used, in fact, earlier this semester for the first homework and the first labs. Sorting an array of objects can be done with the, uh, the comparable interface. And in this case, I'm actually doing it with an array of integer objects. So new integer of 2, new integer of 4, new integer of 3 are actually all integer objects. They implement the comparable interface. So we can call the sort method. The sort method takes an array of objects. A, in this case, an array of comparable objects and it implements the select sort method. The select sort method that we talked earlier about this semester, and in fact, we already implemented it with objects in one of the previous classes, basically the, the class when we did inheritance. So if we want to sort an array of objects, we can implement our own sort method, which uses the comparable interface, basically the compare to method, or we can use java.util.arrays.sort, which uses also the comparable interface. And we should actually make also a note here that all of these methods, binary search and in, in this case, the, uh, the select sort method, they use the comparable interface. So internally, they compare objects with the compare to method. And this compare to method takes another object as a parameter. And let's save it. So you, I will update the lecture notes after the class today. Okay. 
Okay. So arrays are objects. In fact, if you are checking with the instance of, you will find that integer array is an instance of object. Gregorian calendar array is an instance of a cal calendar array, is also instance of object, and is also instance of an array of, of, uh, of objects. However, although we know that an integer uh, it's basically can be assigned to a double because integer is a smaller type than double, an integer array is not a, a double array. So those two are incompatible. We cannot assign an, an array of integers to a variable that is defined of the type double. And similarly, if we look at the hierarchy for objects, we can directly assign an integer wrapper type to a double uh, variable wrapper type. Again, the reason why is that in the hierarchy, integer is not defined as a subclass of double. They're actually siblings, both subclasses of number. So that is important because it tells us that what we were able to do in primitive types, assigning an int to a double, we cannot do it in double types, in, in wrapper types. However, there is actually a, a way to do it since Java 1.5, and that is called boxing and unboxing, which does automatic conversion between primitive types and wrapper types, which basically Java detects when an object instance of, uh, for instance, let's uh, say an object, like for instance, we are assigning two to an integer, or we are assigning the number to, to an integer uh, as the element of an array, automatically will box that primitive type into the new integer type. So this is called boxing, is available in Java 1.5. Unboxing is when we are expecting the int type, basically the primitive type in an operation like addition, but we are passing an object. Like, for instance, we are passing a new integer object. Automatically, Java does conversion between the primitive types and wrapper types. So, boxing is when we pass an, a primitive type to a method or a, an assignment that takes an object wrapper type. So, basically, it does automatically the wrapping of the primitive object into the object wrapper type. And unboxing is when we are passing in a context uh, object wrapper type and it automatically converts it to the int, int primitive type. Now, if we want to store big numbers, all the classes that we talked about up to now, they don't store numbers with unlimited number of digits. Like, for instance, an integer that uh, could represent 50 factorial or a very big number that can actually cannot be stored in a double or in a long. Similarly, we cannot store numbers with, info, with uh, basically unlimited number of digits after the decimal point. There are two classes in Java that can store very large integers as long as they are finite or high precision floating point numbers as long as uh, they, they are finite. They, they have a fin finite number of digits after the decimal point. So big integer is a class that can represent an integer, a whole number of any size, and big decimal it has no limit for the precision, as long as it is, again, finite, it terminates. Both are immutable, and both extend the number class and implement a comparable interface. So we can actually create integers, big integer objects from any number of digits that we would like to represent. And similarly, we can execute divisions with any finite number of digits after the decimal point. Like for instance, we can divide one with three and we can specify that the result of the division should store the first 20 digits. But you can store any number. You can store the first one million digits and it will still store it finitely, exactly on the machine. In fact, as a sequence of digits after the decimal point. And here we have an example. 
that before we were not able to do, which actually stores factorial of 50. So factorial of 50 calls the method factorial with 50, and it first creates an integer, in this case, a big integer object for the big integer 1, and the result is multiplied with a big integer of i for every i. So in this loop, it actually computes in the result a big integer that is factorial of 50. And it prints it in the, in, with the method to string for big integer. You can implement other wrapper types. For instance, if you want to implement a rational type. A rational would represent a ratio exactly, like 1 and 3. 1 divided by 3 by storing the numerator and the denominator. As long as you basically implement all of the methods that are defined as abstract in number, you can implement the rational class. And similarly, we also implement the compare to method to compare two rational numbers. And here I have the implementation. So num numerator and denominator are uh, initialized with 0 and 1. We can create a default rational number as 0, which is 0 div uh, divided by 1. We can create a rational number given a numerator and a denominator. The only requirement is that the greatest common divider of the numerator and the denominator should be 1. So it will reduce the, the, the ratio by the greatest common divider. It, div it divides both the numerator and the denominator with the greatest common divider. So now, as long as we know that the two numbers are co-prime, their, their greatest common divider is 1, it basically stores any rational number in a unique way. So for instance, it stores 1 divided by 2. It also stores 2 divided by 4 internally as 1 divided by 2 because it reduces, it simplifies the ratio until the numerator and the denominator are co-prime. So we can implement all of the methods that are required for two rational numbers. Basically, we can compare rational numbers, we can uh, store them in memory, and so on. So this is basically all for today. I wanted to talk about abstract classes and interfaces, and we defined abstract classes as grouping classes that group all the properties relevant for the subclasses in order to avoid any redundancy, rep repetition of code, and, but we cannot create instances of abstract classes with a new operator. We also talked about abstract methods, which are constraints on the subclasses to implement those abstract methods. And then we talked about interfaces, which are basically a concept similar to a class. However, it only defines methods which are abstract, basically methods that are implemented by any class that implements those interfaces. We are going to do a few exercises as part of the lab today, but we will do that as a separate video. And that video will only treat the lab 9 about abstract classes and interfaces and some issues about exceptions. So at this point, let's save uh, the recording for your colleagues. And if you have any questions, we can take them before we talk about the lab today. The lab today will be a little bit longer than usual, it will be actually the rest of the class today and the time of the lab, three hours and a half, but there are about four, five hundred uh, lines of code that you have to implement. Some are actually part of the lecture notes, but most are actually separate from the lecture notes. So let's again s stop the recording and we will continue with uh, the lab.